Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking your time out to join us online. Today we're going to discuss how the hotel landscape might look like in a post-COVID-19 world. We'll talk about how the industry has been impacted by the global pandemic, the challenges and the opportunities presented and the new normal in terms of what guests now expect. Today, we've got joining us a panel of highly experienced industry professionals. I'll introduce them to you quickly. We have Chris Lund, who's head of hotels for the MENA region at Colliers International. Tim Corden, area senior vice president, Middle East and Africa at Radisson Hotel Group. Simon Casson, who's the president for hotel operations, Europe, Middle East and Africa at Four Seasons. And we have Raki Phillips, who's the CEO of Raz Al Khaimah Tourism Development Authority. So before we start, I'd just like to remind you that you can ask questions and we will leave some time at the end of the session so uh, we can ask the panel some questions. So do keep typing them in on the chat and we'll field those through at the end. Um, before we start the discussion, I'd just like uh, to set the scene to ask Chris to give us a short presentation, just outlining Collier's industry findings and predictions. So, uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much, Gemma. Uh, let me put it up on the screen here. So it will be just a very quick uh, five minute presentation just to set the scene, as you mentioned, uh, what potentially could happen in the future. And I want to emphasize the word could because obviously there's a lot of uncertainty. No one knows uh, definitely what will happen in the coming few months and few years. In the first page here, this is uh, occupancy forecast simulation that we've done for the region. And this includes 20 plus cities in the region, including you know, the big markets like UAE, Saudi Arabia, as well as some of the smaller markets like Jordan and, and Lebanon. And I think, some of the key takeaways here is that what we are seeing for 2020 is potentially a drop in occupancy of 42%. We did have the two good months in the beginning of the year, January and February, so we shouldn't forget that that does count towards the overall 2020 numbers. Uh, and then we're hoping, obviously, that after the summer, you know, things, of course, would not come back to the typical 70 plus 80 plus occupancy rates but we do expect that they will improve slightly from today's numbers um, for 2021 we do expect that uh, especially towards the uh, you know q2 q3 q4 uh, that the market will improve again um, and and that we will still be below 2019 levels but we will be closer so here we expect a 46% increase from 2020. I think just some interesting, you will see that there is a little bit of a, a, a anomaly in the numbers for Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, and that's obviously because of the Umrah and uh, pilgrimage, which has been currently uh, suspended and, and taken more of a slow uh, approach there at the moment. Then you would see where we expect the markets to rebound the fastest is typically the markets that have uh, had the highest occupancy rates in the past, such as the UAE markets, you know, in Egypt with Cairo and Alexandria, which do see a lot of regional and uh, domestic demand. And then in, in, in Saudi thereafter, and then you will see the markets with typically lower occupancies like Kuwait City and Beirut and Sharm el Sheikh would be the, the last ones to come out of, uh, of this in terms of occupancy rates. Now, in terms of what will be important in 2020, I've classified this into three categories, how I see it. Now, the first one is, I think, trust and transparency. This is something that uh, hotel guests will want to see in the future. Uh, the second point is for hotels, they have to be creative and realistic. So to match these two characteristics together. And the third is to follow what the government is doing. So let me just take you through one by one. So the first one is uh, the trust and transparency, which I think is, is very, very important. And we've already seen this you know, immediately as, as uh, hotels were starting to reopen. Uh, we saw that a lot of companies uh, jumped on this to try to make sure that they communicate this trust and, and transparency in terms of hygiene, disinfection, etc. So we see 
few examples here on the screen is the Bureau of Veritas safeguard uh, label, which basically means that they will uh, audit several hotels to make sure that they are abiding by certain uh, hygiene and disinfecting uh, protocols. And this again, it's, it's, a, it's a label that the consumer will see and trust that this particular hotel is, is doing the right thing. And I think this region is definitely pioneering in that regard. We have Jumeirah Al Nasim, which is the first hotel in the world to receive the label. Uh, then I think in, in Rasa Kema, the Rak PDA uh, has, has done this on a, on a quite a big scale. Maybe uh, Rocky can mention a bit more about that later on. Uh, ruling it out to 45 hotels in Rosa Um And it's all, you see, before, you know, it's all the big names uh, in the past about the, the hotel names were the, were the very important names. Now consumers, they're looking for these trusted names in the healthcare sector. So you'll see Cleveland Clinic, you'll see, uh, like, with, with the Four Seasons, have partnered with John Hopkins. Uh, you'll see with Hilton, they've partnered with the Mayo Clinic, uh, then Radisson hotels with SGS, you will see as well uh, disinfecting products that have been uh, used as well, like Hilton are using Lysol branding, uh, and then technologies like Marriott, they're using this L electrostatic spraying technology to, to clean the rooms. So it's just showing that the landscape here is changing a little bit, uh, and this is making, I think, consumers trust these uh, these hotels that they're doing the right thing the second point is uh you know being creative and realistic because it's not a typical market that the hotels are operating in so hotels will have to operate for a while with reduced occupancy and and how do they do that you know in terms of the manning in terms of you know what do they do with the empty rooms do they keep them closed do they use them as private offices like we've seen for example rogue hotel in in dubai we're offering to have uh, they use one of their hotel rooms as a private office you know uh, that could be one one uh, opportunity as well i think technology you know the the hotel industry has been very slow historically at adopting new technologies but this potentially could push the hotel companies to adopt the technology in a in a different way you know we've heard about the the keyless uh, room app to get into your room. We've heard about this for 10 years, I think, but I've never personally stayed in a hotel that asked me to use an app to get into the room. Uh, but this, you know, I think hotel companies are looking at this much more seriously now. You know, nowadays you can, you can control anything with an app. You can control the elevator, you can control the temperature. So it's just about how all this obviously is implemented into that uh, hotel experience. I think food and beverage as well is going to be something important. Um, whether it is, you know, hosting ghost kitchens to be able to do deliveries, partnering with the, with the local communities, serving the local communities. Uh, and I think it will be the first time ever that hotels will get a complaint for having a lavish buffet on, uh, which that would never happen in, in the past. Um, so we're definitely seeing it. A kind of a change in mindset there. Like just some example is Noma restaurant in Denmark. It's a two-star Michelin chef uh, restaurant. They were uh, serving 20 course uh, menus in, in the restaurants for 300 pounds. Now they change the menu just to two items, a cheeseburger and a veggie burger. And this is a two-star Michelin restaurant. So it just shows this is, you know, even, even uh, those fine dining restaurants have to think creatively and, and uh, be flexible for a certain period of time. Uh, I think promotions and offers important. Obviously, you know, what happens when you reduce the rate, it's difficult to get it back up. So it's very important to look carefully at how hotels will build that demand. Uh, and that brings me to sales and marketing, which probably those are the teams that are uh, maybe a little bit confused at the moment because, you know, they don't know exactly who do they target. Uh, obviously, all the typical uh, sales channels, um, you know, they open or close, it's difficult to manage those. So it, it really depends on what's happening with the greater picture, you know, which are the target markets that really can come to your hotel. So I think it's going to be very important as well to collaborate with the, with the local players as well, you know, just because your hotel is safe and clean doesn't mean that the journey to your hotel will be safe and clean. And then you won't get that customer. 
So how do you, you know, collaborate with your DMCs, with your transportation providers, your activities to make sure that they are uh, abiding by the same level of hygiene as your hotel is as well. And then, you know, to not forget that people are staying in a hotel for an experience. They're not staying in a hotel to be locked up in a room. Uh, so, you know, there's all the hygiene part, which I think we've talked about, but still uh, people are looking for experience. And I think now even more than, than before, because now people are um, hesitating more to travel. So they really want to travel for a purpose, for a reason. It has to be an authentic experience. It has to be something they're passionate about. And then I think it's just to be prepared for the future. Um, you know, are we looking at new kinds of tourism, uh, lodges, uh, something that is already a bit uh, social distancing in the concept? And then the last point here, which I think probably the most important is walk before you run. Because we've seen now with the Eid break in, in the Middle East, we've seen some hotels perhaps opening up too fast with perhaps too little uh, staff in them. And obviously then the hotels could not cope with that level of, uh, of uh, number of customers in, in the hotel. So I think this is as well very important to take it uh, step by step. Then the last point, just very quickly, I think it is important to note that, um, you know, all this will start with the governments. What's happening in terms of um, health advisories, in terms of following restrictions, uh, what's imposed on the tourists, on the hotels, and of course, the reopening of the air routes and the borders. Now, we've seen lately some announcements like Emirates, they are reopening some routes, they're starting for tourism, they're starting with the Arab countries, you know, with the regional uh, travel. Uh, we've seen as well some, some countries in Europe, they're planning potential uh, air routes between specific approved countries. Uh, and then of course, it's the destination marketing and the awareness of that destination. And, and pretty much the same things of trust and transparency has to be done on a destination wide basis as well, and not just on a hotel basis because that brings into that is a whole ecosystem of, of tourism that's quite important uh, I think so with that you know I think uh, that sums up my presentation and we can continue on the discussion brilliant thanks so much Chris really appreciate that, that really um, did set the scene I think we covered all bases so we can uh, work from that in terms of our discussion so and first of all, we were looking at the hotel occupancy rates or what they could be, as you, as you said, rather than um, exactly. Um, first of all, I'd just like to ask Raki, um, because Ras Al Khaimah was one of the destinations that seemed to be up there this year and looking forward to next year. So can you tell us what you've been witnessing um, in the destination in terms of the, the hotel occupancies? Yeah, hi, Jim. I mean, uh, leading up to when things started closing down, uh, the first couple of months, probably till mid-March, we were having a stellar start to the year. Um, occupancies were running in the, in, the, in the low 80s. Things were doing really well. We were gearing up for a great Easter break and going into Eid and everything. So we're, actually, the, the performance of the market was doing quite well. Mid-March, we got obviously hit very bad, just like everyone else, and we started to see a decline. 10 out of 10 hotels closed. Um, some hotels got turned into quarantine hotels. I mean, we did everything that, that we could. Um, however, ever since that happened, our biggest focus was on the recovery. Because we know, I mean, this industry is a resilient industry. This is the worst hit pandemic in my career, at least. Um, but we knew that we would bounce back. And I think uh, we put a lot of different measures in place. We worked on a stimulus package that was very focused on making sure employees were protected, business owners, there was liquidity for the hotels to be able to work on, um, and that we would be ready for a rebound once it happens. Um, we've started to see the light. Um, I'm not gonna say we're out of it, but, I mean, but Christopher touched on some phenomenal points about how hotels get ready when things open up. You know, uh, many of our hotels in Ras Al Khaimah were all inclusive destinations. And focused on the domestic market, they don't need all inclusive. Um, changing to not offering buffets, making sure people wear masks, and and you're hoping that they're smiling behind those masks. I mean, the experience was 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 quite different. 
Um, but we've started to see a great uptick. I mean, just last weekend, our occupancies were peaking at around 60%. Um, we are blessed as a destination. We've got um, uh, sprawling spaces. So a lot of our resorts are much, much bigger. We've got some villa concepts, such as the, Ritz, the two Ritz Carltons that we have, the one in Al Wad and the one on the beach in Al Hamra. Um, but, it, but we've got the opportunity to, to be able to welcome guests, still have the social distancing measures in place because of the space capacities. And we're starting to see recovery the only thing that we're very focused on, and I tell my hotels um, that we work with on a regular basis, don't drop average rate. There's limited demand out there. Um, the people will come. Uh, I'm very blessed and happy to say that RAC has really been the shortcation, as we like to call it, spot since, since the recovery. We, there's no need for hotels to panic and drop average rate. And we're, we're seeing them try to maintain it right now and adjusting to the new normal, and, and I think it's working well. Great, thanks Raki. Now, obviously we have Simon and Tim with us. Now, Simon can talk very much from the luxury side of things, whereas Tim, you've got a broader mix and also some business hotels in there, which is going to affect things a lot differently. Um, let's start with Simon, talk about some of maybe the regional nuances that you've seen or going to see um, in terms of occupancy um, and where you might think see things bouncing back first. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gemma. Good afternoon, Dubai. It's, it's great to be part of this panel. Um, listen, I think the word unprecedented has been somewhat overused, but is particularly apt for this situation that we're in, and particularly for, for our business. If you're in hospitality, travel, um, the impacts are deep, and we know that they're going to, to be long running. I think it's fundamentally about how you prepare for that new normal, how you go through it as humanly as possible, um, but also from a process and preparedness point of view, how you're ready to serve guests as they start coming back. Um, the impact has, has clearly been dramatic. Uh, you know, in the region I oversee, I have 40 hotels and 20 six countries and uh, we closed 80% of those hotels. Happily, we're on that front edge of some of them starting to, to reopen now. Um, but occupancy is very suppressed and low. Um, I would love a, a racky rack occupancy of up in the 60%, but you know, as Racky rightly says, for a certain products will come back sooner. And certainly as I look at our hotels in uh, places like the, the Seychelles, or Mauritius that have individual villa product, or Athens, which will be reopening soon, which has you know a large number of private bungalows. I think those leisure destinations will come back more at the front end than the corporate destinations. Um, you mentioned luxury, and I think that's a sort of fortunate factor, other than the brand and the resilience of the brand and the loyalty of our guests. Our hotels tend to have the benefits of space. So whether it's at our resort there in Jumeirah Beach, it's a small pool <laughs> and public areas that you would maybe see in a 400 bedroom hotel. So plenty of room for spacing, both in the outdoor areas and the restaurants. And uh, space is going to become, you know, a vital commodity as we try to reopen and be relevant for socially distanced service. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Tim, now, what, what's happening with, you know, Radisson? What kind of trends are you noticing? And what are some of the difficulties you're facing, perhaps with some of the hotels where you really rely on the corporate business? Um, could you perhaps tell us how you might be adapting as well, you know, to Chris mentioned about, you know, um, different concepts within business hotels to bring people in from outside and, and do things safely, even if they're not staying there, perhaps. Uh, so, yeah, could you just give, shed a little bit of light on that for us? Sure, happy to, Gemma. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Dubai. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. A bit of a, a our conference call talents have been tested over the last few months, and a, a little bit of feedback there. Um, yeah, uh, fundamentally, as hoteliers, you know, we we look after people. So we look after our guests. We look after our teams. We look after our, our business partners. Uh, and I don't think that has changed at all. Uh, how we do so is what's changing. 
So adapting our operations to making sure that we give our, primarily our customers, but then also our, our business partners and, our, and very importantly our teams, the confidence that the place they're going to work in is safe and for consumers where they're going to visit and stay it is safe and secure um, in this new world, uh, which all of us are having to discover and find our way through because nobody's lived through a pandemic in uh, of this scale um, in, in a kind of a modern age. So what we've, do, what we've done is taken the approach of uh, trying to have a pragmatic solution which fits as many hotels as possible, uh, very clear protocols which every hotel can implement relatively easily, um, but then monitored and audited by a third party because we think that accreditation will be a uh, third party accreditation. We're very important in terms of gaining trust uh, from Chris's presentation, that was a key point on there. And as you rightly say, Gemma, you know, uh, our hotels predominantly rely on corporate travel and their business travel um, for the majority of their business. And, and that's going to be, I think, really important when large organizations look to restart sending their people traveling all over the world. How can they assure that they're going to be safe and secure when they get there? And along with airline partners and a WTTC, I think having a global standard of what safe looks like and what the new normal actually is, it is important so that everybody can understand that what's being offered is somehow consistent and trustworthy uh, on a global level. Um, I don't think it's as helpful if people do very, very different things and what's acceptable for one person perhaps isn't for another. And hoteliers are many things, but we are not epidemiologists. So we do need to take advice, I believe, and we do need to listen to the experts about how we reopen our hotels and how we operate our businesses. Um, of the circa 120 hotels that, that I overlook in Middle East and Africa, um, we've been fortunate in some respects that not so many have closed, but the type of business we've been operating has been very, very different indeed. Um, and yeah, the type of products that, that Simon and Raki have already talked about, resorts with more space, have definitely been the ones that have come back most quickly. Um, and I'm sure that that trend will continue over the, uh, the, the short to medium term. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to the trust and transparency and the hygiene in a second, but just quickly, just wanted to ask Chris, um, with the occupancies that you've put in your chart there, can you give us a quick idea of any global comparisons and how the region is faring or might fare compared to other areas of the world, just quickly? Yeah, so it is, uh, it is quite scattered, obviously, destination by destination, but in, a, in the big picture, I think uh, Asia, and, and particularly China, is a step ahead, I think, of the rest of the world. And that's two reasons. One reason is because uh, they went through this earlier and they are uh, much better out of the curve than the Middle East, Europe and uh, the Americas at the moment. And the second reason is it's a huge market. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about domestic tourism, there's, uh, there's enough of, of people to, to target. So I think that, that domestic tourism has really helped. Uh, China. Now they're still not out of it in terms of, you know, the hotels are not uh, celebrating every night uh, closing at 100% occupancy um, but but they are uh, coming back to a certain extent. I think the rest of the world Middle East is, is pretty similar to, to Europe, you know, this minus um, you know, up to minus 70 80% in, in April was a tough month but I think from here on out we'll see a, a bit gradual smooth out and that's why we're we're saying minus 42 percent for the region which is sure. relatively similar to to what they expect in in europe as well okay thanks chris um that's great so moving on to the trust and transparency i think we all agree um that that's really important every hotel group has now partnered with you know um as i say four seasons with john hopkins or radisson with sgs others um are partnered with various other organizations as Chris mentioned. Um, what I'm interested in is, I think Tim touched upon having a global standard, which would obviously be ideal because it can get confusing from guests, you know, what do I expect, expect from this chain and this destination? Perhaps Raki can tell us a bit more about 
what you've been doing as a destination and supporting hotels to actually get a standard within your destination as a good starting point. Um, yeah, if you could just tell us a little bit more about that, first of all. Yeah, I mean, we realize that coming out of um, things, you know, as things start to improve, our only business is going to be the domestic market and understanding that people have been quarantining in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and the other Emirates for, for you know, well, close to two months, and they want to get out and experience things. But the issue was we needed to make sure that the hotels were ready. And, and listen, I've been a hotelier since I was 19 years old, and when things are busy, you're rocking and rolling. The moment things slow down, you forget how to open a door and it's like you're starting over again and, and we had to reset everyone for the team but now you, you add a pandemic to it and people's fears and and, um, and everything so so we had to put a, a, a standard that went across the Emirates so what we did is we worked with the different hotel brands that we have uh, we, we have a we have Hilton Hotels, Accor, um, Marriott obviously with the Ritz Carlton and some of the local chains and we sat with them and decided to create what we called our rack stay safe uh, policies. And really it's just the, um, the conditions that are required for you to be able to operate a hotel safely. It's not your usual hospitality where, you know, it's, it's, it's not in our nature to social distance. It's not in our SOPs, but how do you teach people to do it in the right way? Um, so we put together the terms and conditions of how that's done. We did a couple of revisions of it, shared it with the hotels early on as we felt things were going to open up, gave them time to do it. And then we partnered with Bureau Veritas to get a global standard across the entire Emirate so that, so that they're doing the inspections and they're coming back with their recommendation. Understanding that some of the hotels are also really tight on cash flow and, and they're looking at survival versus adding additional expenses. Us as an authority took, took over that cost of working with Bureau Veritas and getting the certification in place. But we also made sure that every single employee goes through a COVID test and goes through the training requirements, which is something that we had funded ourselves. Um, and, and luckily that has worked out fairly well. I'm not gonna lie to you, the first weekend you always have hiccups and things where we're trying to figure, figure things out. But I have to commend the entire destination really adapted well, pivoted very well. And I think we're lucky because we are a developing destination. We've got, you know, a much closer knit group. So for us to be able to, to pivot and make things happen pretty fast was, was pretty remarkable. Thanks, Raki. Um, I mean, obviously, Razal Khan has done a stellar job in, in that respect. I wonder how other destinations are supporting hotels or do hotels kind of feel like, they're very much on their own and we'll get our standard in place and then we'll, we'll you know we'll work with the authorities um tim and simon i'd like to ask you that question um destination support simon first <laughs> yeah listen i didn't ultimately we're in a business that's that's powered by people and unless you as an organization take a pause to recognize what those people have been through often uh, in unusual confinement in difficult family uh, environments, financial stresses and pressures that will have accompanied it. Um, you've got to recognize that these employees are coming back in from a different headspace than that which they left. And they're also coming back in a world of work that's going to be different than the one they had left. So we're spending a lot of time on onboarding and how we're working to prepare our employees providing support and counseling and advice for those that have been through difficult situations, um, helping them to understand what this new normal is going to look like, and then having a very robust review of all our operating guidelines, because some of them you know, won't make sense in the future. Many of them have to be adjusted, perhaps temporarily, some permanently. Um, but we've spent a significant amount of time seeing how that new guest journey will look like from the moment they land in destination to every touch point in a business that is you. And you know, our DNA is all driven around uh, intuitive interactions, connectivity, smiles, um, you know, anticipating guest needs. You know, I think those fundamentals won't change. We'll still keep doing what we're doing, but they're having to be executed in a somewhat different way. Um, I think it's important that we all are uh, guided by global guidance, whether that's you know, uh, CDC, WHO, or for our industry, WTTC. But I think smartly, as all of the brands you know, 
present here have recognized, you also have to have a system of independent verification, something telling you that this company has invested in health and safety and is partnering. In our case, we have this you know, lead with care program that is multifaceted from the employees, from how they get to work, from how we re-enter them into this new orbit of work, to the adjusted operating procedures, to any incidents that might, you know, that might happen. And so, you know, we have this partnership with, uh, you know, John Hopkins, which is, you know, really a dialogue between them and us sharing, uh, sharing information and supporting, but also accrediting the processes that we go through during this period of COVID. Right, thank you. Um, and talking about seamless experiences and collaboration with destinations, uh, Tim, well, actually, we've just had a question come through, which kind of blends in with this. Um, Faisal Hashim says, do you think hotels should provide ground transportation um, from airports to hotels? So I guess, so that's part of the safe experience um or is that done with partners again destination support and collaboration tim can you tell us a bit about your thoughts on on that sure i mean i, I agree with what, a lot of what uh, simon said um you know restarting operations even if a hotel wasn't closed and then racky said it as well you know, when you're busy everything runs smoothly and then you, know, you have a, a couple of weeks of low occupancy or quietness and uh, everyone forgets what they're supposed to be doing so we've, we've treated it a little bit like reopening hotels, even though they haven't closed in some cases. And um, that's a new set of protocols, a new set of training around one of our core values, which was already there, which was Radisson Cares. So that's the guest journey and the employee journey to and from work whilst they're at work, or the guest journey to and from the uh, point of arrival to the hotel whilst they're in the hotel, and how do we get them back to the airport or, or wherever they came from safely and securely. Some of that's destination specific, obviously. So, um, you know, in Dubai, for example, there's, uh, there's a great efforts been made with um, the Metro and taxis and Ubers to really secure people safely. And, and, you know, Dubai's leading airline Emirates has also made some incredible efforts to try and secure their passengers. So we feel quite comfortable that that's something that's been taken care of very, very well indeed. But there are other destinations where perhaps not quite so prepared because the uh, the virus is a little bit later there or they just aren't in a position to be as prepared. In those uh, instances, we have to make sure that we take responsibility mm. and secure our guests' welfare um, as best as we possibly can. And that may very well mean um, airport transportation or or even transportation you know, right to the uh, into the airport itself, because in some destinations, dropping someone off curbside just isn't really safe either. So we've really looked at an end-to-end -end process and how do we adapt what we're doing today to really make sure that we're caring about our guests' health and reassuring them that they can travel with us as safely as possible. So yeah, the, the fundamental things we're doing or the reason we do them hasn't changed. We're still looking after people, we're still caring for people, we're still trying to give them a, a fabulous experience. Um, but what we're doing to deliver that, yeah, has been uh, has been altered by um, by this pandemic, obviously. Great, thank you. Um, and Simon touched upon um, it's very important to communicate what you're doing as a hotel group or as a destination to keep people safe. Um, the problem is that guests don't always comply, do they? <laughs> now it would vary, I'm sure, from uh, one hotel to the next or destination to the next. But there have been instances where people haven't been social distancing; um, they've been crammed together in swimming pools and things like that. So I guess try not to be too controversial, but just wondered if anyone had any thoughts on that, on, you know, if you do get that situation, how are you going to get people to stop themselves from being people <laughs> and to, to keep them safe? So are you going to chuck them out the pool when, you know, they're, they're sitting next to each other? Um, maybe, maybe Raki, you could maybe answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, listen, it, it, it happened in Russell Kema. It, people, like I said, have been in quarantine for so long. They come out as their full sense of, of freedom and, and uh, they think they're heading to Ibiza, you know. And <laughs> so in all honesty, I mean, I mean, it, it's an education process to both employees as well as to the guests. Um, 
at the end of the day, we never want to jeopardize uh, anyone's health or safety, both from a guest perspective or any of our employees. Um, so what we did is we realized those issues were going to happen. We were seeing it in other places that started to open up and crowds were, were gathering more than five. To, you know, it naturally, it, we're social beings as humans. We, we connect by being together. Um, but we, what we did is we actually partnered with the different authorities and were able to sit down and say, what can we do to be able to make sure that um, we are uh, following correct procedures, we're putting places in sign. And a simple thing that we did as a destination was signage. We put up signage under the, the Russell Kama government and the signage clearly stated, you have to wear a mask, you have to social distance, uh, restaurant capacity was at 30%, buffets were not served. And we over communicated the message and the things that we were doing, including in-room flyers, your email upon arrival, everything was there. So what happened is a lot of our guests who have been trained to be friendly and not to say no, and the customer is always right, and we're getting maybe harassed or pushed back by a customer, they can now point to a sign and say, this is the government that, that, that's saying that. And to Christopher's point earlier in the presentation, the government mandates that come through are, are there to support uh, the businesses, but it's also to support the consumers. And it helped a lot for them just to point at a big sign and say, it's not me, your waiter, that's coming up with this rule. You know, it really is the government. And and that helped ease things and make things a lot better. And and I think we've we've learned and partnered together and and it's it's only going to get better. Right. Okay. <laughs> so you're not going to start chucking people out of the uh, the hotels in Russell Gaiman. <laughs> If I do, I'll wear a mask and then no one can tell it's me. <laughs> um, I want to come back to Chris, actually. And we, we've had a couple of questions come through about investment, development, pipeline. Um, now, obviously, the Middle East, um, North Africa region is, is, is known for having a really healthy pipeline. It'd um, be interesting to know what investor and developer sentiment is at this point in time. Um, so, Chris, could you um, give us a quick idea of, you know, what you've noticed in terms of trends in that respect? Yep. No, thank you very much, Gemma. It's, uh, it's an interesting topic uh, in terms of development and investment, especially in this region, because uh, obviously just prior to the pandemic, there were still a lot of hotels either in the development stage on the drawing board uh, or, you know, already with a hole in the ground and, and the floors started to come out of the ground. So, so obviously that was very relevant to a lot of uh, the investors out there. We did actually run a survey with uh, a lot of our clients that own hotels and that are developing hotels. And we found that uh, 65% said they will not scale back their development plans. So 35% did say that they will scale back some of the development plans. Now, that doesn't mean that the 65% will not see any de delays because obviously there's still the whole uh, supply chain. There is the social distancing from the contractor. So all of those things, they might put a bit of delays on the development process. Uh, but I think ultimately, those 65% still committed to finishing their projects. And that might be, you know, for multiple reasons, you know, they have uh, already secured the, the money to develop this, um, that, that there's no issue with the funding. And then of course you have the 35% that will scale back. Potentially some of these, they're a bit on the, on the wait and see uh, fence as well to see what will happen, you know, how bad will this be? And I think, you know, now as the months progress, I think those, they will have a clear answer whether, you know, they do progress or not. And I think it really depends as well, how far did they get in the development process? If they are 90% complete, it's very difficult to turn back. Yeah. You can't undo, it's not a Lego set that you can undo. I think uh, that would be quite expensive. Uh, then on the investment front, I think uh, obviously globally in any crisis, uh, you have obviously the, the, the cash rich investors that are just waiting for the next crisis to come and, and uh, buy a hotel on sale. Mm. Uh, so obviously you have those. I, I, I don't think we've seen that much of that type of activity yet. Uh, and now I'm talking globally, but I think that potentially could happen 
in the next, you know, six months to a year's time, where some hotel owners, you know, they might just say, you know, uh, I'm done. I want to retire from the hotel business um, and, and sell my asset to another group. And do you think that we might see um, developers and hoteliers working together to have some completely new concepts um, now that we've got this new norm, you know, social distancing, etc. I mean, Simon was talking about how Four Seasons, for example, um, are quite well protected in that respect because their hotels are based on private spaces. You're not all crammed in together. Um, but, you know, obviously we've seen the, the mid-market come up in the region recently, but then will we still, you know, continue to see that trend, for example? Where, where do you think there might be shifts in terms of hospitality concepts? Yeah, obviously it's a very, it's an evolving industry that we're in. Right. And I think already in the past, I would say five years, especially, uh, there's been a lot of interest in a concept that we at Colliers, we call IWA tourism. Oh, so yeah. IWA stands for Eco Wellness Agri and Adventure Tourism. So all that is, is pretty uh, conforming within that social distancing kind of tourism because it's out in the nature, it's, it's in lodges, it's uh, uh, focused on the experience rather than on the accommodation itself. And I think uh, especially Rosakema has been one of the leading destinations in, in, in uh, providing this kind of uh, tourism you know, drivers. <laughs> Mm. Such as the lodges, the, the, the zip line experience, and, and combining that with the hotel experience as well. I think this is something that we will see more of, I think, in, in the future. Mm. I don't think you would see a hotel that would be built, you know, just to, to house, for example, medical workers, because that would be obviously a very short term approach. By the time it's built, there's no more need for it. <laughs> but I think it's more the, the, the bigger picture of how we as, as guests will. Uh, want to travel and what kind of experiences we will want to to have. Great, thank you. Um, Simon, what's uh, the sentiment been from from owners um, in terms of you know current properties and then maybe upcoming properties? Yeah, thanks, Gemma. Maybe speaking to the development pipeline first. You know, as the colleagues on the panel will know there's a very different tenor to development it's it's long term there's a different outlook and particularly within the four seasons world you know we have generational contracts and these contracts you know management agreements for hotels that we're planning in the future will outlive all of us who are party to those contracts uh, we've been very much in close with uh, closely in touch with the development partners checking on status and product um, as christopher said it very much depends if you have a project in early design development or one ready to, to hit the market is different. But we've not had a single project uh, has cancelled. There have inevitably been uh, some slowdowns, pauses and, and delays. And, you know, for us, I, as I mentioned, overseas Europe as well. And we're opening our new flagship hotel in Madrid this year in Canaleas. Uh, it's on schedule to open in September. And that's exciting to bring a new hotel to the market. Clearly, we're having to relook at the assumptions we had for the hotel in the short term. Um, but that partnership between us and the owners is decades long. And so if you're having, you know, a bump or a wobble, in, there will be a bump and a wobble over that 60-year term at some point. If it happens at the beginning, you know, that's how it is. Um, very different, Gemma, for the existing hotel owners because these owners uh, of assets are not used to providing working capital to fund the hotels um, to stay solvent. A hotel that is closed is not uh, a cheap commodity, much like uh, an A380 on you know, Sir Tim's uh, runway. If it's sitting there flying, that's a, a problem. The same for hotels. They have a significant burn rate, depending on how much of the staff cost you're continuing. Um, so I've never been closer in touch with all our owner partners, working with them, working on their financing with banks, uh, scheduling lines of credit, looking at how we can partner, clearly from a, a significant corporate and hotel-based cost-cutting process to minimize that burn rate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But every one of them is optimistic. You know, we have amazing owners that have a vision for the future. You don't put together a Four Seasons hotel for three, five, seven hundred million dollars and do it with a short-term expectation. 
you do it as a legacy and as part of putting something into a market that will lead that market for generations to come. And so, you know, great owners, great partners, some robust conversations, some highly stressed situations. Uh, you know, clearly, and I will tell you that, you know, with, with Canda, it's, it's not easy, but it draws us all closer. And we're working through and seeing how together, in partnership, we're able to get through this short-term pain and make sure that we're ready to have adjusted operating as we start to emerge. In, uh, but emerging at the same time through certainly a period of uh, suppressed occupancies. Right, thank you. Thanks very much. Tim, is there any um, change of plans in terms of Radisson's pipeline and development in the Middle East region? Oh, we've seen some slowdown um, and a few delays, uh, which is completely to be expected. Um, uh, as Chris was saying, you know, some projects um, might be paused or, or pushed back by a few months. Uh, certainly the pipeline we were expecting to materialize in 2020 um, will now materialize later into 2020 or some might slip into the first quarter of 2021. But we've not had any projects drop out, we've not had any owners um, uh, try, and, um, try and delay significantly, let's say, because I think everyone understands that a hotel is a, a decade or a double decade investment at least. So um, whilst this pandemic is, is catastrophe if you like for our business today um, it's unlikely to be so in three four five certainly ten years time and over that time period um, hotel investors I think generally understand that this is still a good place to be. Those hotel projects that are at the very early stages we have uh, worked with some of our owners to to look at configurations and the type of materials that are being used like say additional hard services that kind of thing which we think will be more appropriate in the future in a post-pandemic environment and more suited to what our guest expectations um, will be in that time. So there is some amendments and some changes where, where possible, but, but no wholesale um, revisions, let's say. Working capital and cash has never been more important uh, for existing hotels. Um, it's been, cash is king, has is, is been uh, a phrase used for a very long time, but never more so than now. Um, and we're working incredibly closely with all of our owners to, to try and hold their hand and help them through what's an incredibly difficult period. When, as Simon says, a, a closed hotel or a hotel running a very you know, single digit occupancy or something like that uh, it is not a cheap um, exercise. So we've had to really work very hard and very closely with our owner community to help them through it. And, and Chris touched on an interesting point, which I, which I agree with. Um, he called it the, you know, the eco-tourism, if you like. I think that's a trend that we've seen over the last few years, which is probably going to take five to 10 years to fully materialize. I, I, I wonder if that trend is now going to get accelerated and something that we would have expected a long time to become, let's say, mainstream is now going to actually become mainstream in, in, in a very short period of time as people look for more out of the way destinations, as opposed to the more, um, more common, perhaps perceived to be more crowded tourist hotspots. So I wonder if we'll see more hotel developments over the next couple of years in much more um, isolated areas and based on more experiential travel. Something that was already happening, but probably will accelerate now. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Well, I'm aware of the time. I think this is a topic we could probably discuss for about five hours, but we do have a few questions. So I'm gonna flick over to those for a second. Um, if you'd like to answer, just put your hand up, that's gonna make it easy. <laughs> So I have a question here from Make Vetter, manager of GCC at Visit Britain. How do hotels plan to compete with platforms like Airbnb in this new world? Perhaps people will be more comfortable using smaller properties as opposed to major hotels. Um, who would like to answer that one? Oh, Tim was first. <laughs> it's like fingers on the button. <laughs> Go Tim. <laughs> Airbnb provides a uh, different product from the hotel, the traditional hotel sector, and will continue to provide a different product. And I think what Airbnb uh, or hotels can provide and always have done is a consistent and trustworthy experience for, for our guests. And with Airbnb, that's not necessarily always the case. I don't want to be critical of it, but it's just a different environment, a different um, experience. 
and it's also part of a sharing uh, sharing um, economy. So these are places that you would rent, which have been used perhaps the day before by somebody else, one of the family. And how can you really be absolutely assured that that is a now safe place for you and your family to go and stay? Whereas in a hotel, we like to think that we provide, as part of our brand promise and the trust that we have with our customers, um, a safe environment, as we've already talked about today, and the various different processes and protocols we have in place to assure that. So whilst Airbnb will continue to be an important part of hospitality, it will continue to disrupt our operations, I think that it offers something a little bit different from what we aim to offer at the moment. At least. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to the next question. Um, this one is from Gurav uh, for the MD at TBO Group. Um, how can travel agents play a role in helping with revival of travel? Um, can they play a key role in preparing customers and hotel guests with information, procedures, formalities, etc.? cetera? Um, perhaps Raki, actually. Go for it, Raki. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, TBO is a, is, a, is a great client of ours, so I appreciate uh, Gaurav's question. Uh, but what's important is, is we've been hosting a lot of uh, seminars, uh, online, you know, uh, conferences like this, where we've really sat with the travel agents and understood what their customer needs are, and also from a destination perspective, what, what we need. Um, when you've got a wide range of hotels from five-star luxury villa products down to um, our, our glamping camps, it's so important to work with the travel agents and the tour operators and the DMCs to see what can happen. Um, we know that in the very short term, it's all been domestic. We've actually met with many of our DMC partners to see how are they working with the local corporate business? Um, how can we attract corporate business that would want to come over or even incentive business where employees want to sneak out or, 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 or get away? Um, but, but the tour operators, the travel agents, I mean, they're, they're, a, they're a big part of the success of our hotels. As long as they can work with the destination, work with the hotels, not just focus on dropping rates, because you can't drive volume during this time. And to be honest, we've put restrictions on hotels on the maximum capacity of occupancies. We don't want to drive volumes at this point. Soon we will be able to work with us. Um, let's have conversations. Let's see what we can do. And I'm sure as a destination, we can work on incentives that make sense for the customers to be able to come to the destination. Fab, thank you, thanks. I'm gonna give this next one to Simon. Um, let me just read this, it's a little bit complicated. Um, Naja, sales manager um, from a hotel in Sharjah Expo Center. How do you as leaders in hospitality, um, human, oh right, how do you see the needs of human employees, so HR versus uh, online travel agencies and social media. Well, this is quite complicated, right? Hold on, let me, <laughs> let me read this properly. Um, right, okay. I think it's talking actually talking about how um, new roles as in sales to meet guest needs. So how um, HR might evolve within a hotel to meet new guest requirements. I think that's what I've managed to glean from that one. <laughs> Simon, could you um, answer that one for me? Happy to, Gemma. Thank you for throwing that one. <laughs> but just a thanks for the question. If I understood it correctly, which uh, perhaps I haven't, but the role of HR in a hotel has always been central because the role of people in a hotel is central. And I think, you know, sort of alluding back a little bit to what I was saying, you know, before the, the, the human fuel that drives all of our businesses and is the differentiator from a service perspective, um, is, is critical to all our businesses, no matter what level of the market you're playing in. Um, and so we'll support connecting uh, with the employees through this period of furlough. If they're not in work, you know, we have you know, weekly online engagement sessions, uh, virtual town hall meetings. We have connections for the employees with third, third party resources. You know, it can be around family issues. It can be around health issues. the people and culture HR community to connect with the employees is more important uh, than ever at this time. 
yeah that was that was correct it was talking about that so well done <laughs> after it was a it was a very long um question that one so we've got one more um from katrina in coventry in the uk uh what positive messaging can you give to the global traveler in your area of the hotel industry um whether it's business or luxury so i guess it's yeah how you get the the guest message across to different sectors of the market and give them confidence in returning to your hotel so maybe tim can talk about business Simon can talk about luxury very quickly before we um get chopped off <laughs> Well, the world's a big place and um, those experiences are still out there waiting to be had. Um, and from a business perspective, clients still need to be visited, meetings still need to happen. You still need to be able to engage with people, particularly in the Middle East, I think. Um, it's important to be there face to face as much as possible. That need and that human interaction is not going to go away. It may be reduced for a period of time, but it won't be eliminated. It's part of our DNA. So. From my point of view, it's about making sure that we're as well positioned as possible to assure those clients when they do decide to travel and decide that's right for their organization, that we're a, a very relevant, relevant option. But that, from a commercial point of view, I think won't be necessarily about price. It'll be about the safety of the experience as we talked about and, and probably then around flexibility. Um, cancellation policies will, will be a different thing completely in the post pandemic world, I, I believe. And I think that's probably going to be more relevant than, um, than dropping price. That's certainly not the way to go. I agree with Raki on that one. Mm. Simon, um, on the subject of uh, positive messaging to your, your guests and your travellers, um, with luxury, how can you make it sexy still, even given it's going to be a slightly more sanitary experience in the future? So you combine sexy and sanitary there, if yeah. I'm right? I want to know how you're going to do it. <laughs> 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 Listen, I think it's about trust in travel. And I think, you know, brands that have high engagement with their uh, clients have already built up that trust. And I think it's a question of letting them know that we're ready. You know, the teams are ready to welcome you back. And we're not ready in a haphazard way. We're ready in a very methodical way. We've prepared, we've adjusted, we've collaborated with world-class partners to make sure that our processes are in place. And you deserve it as a client. I think very much. You know, our industry is timeless. It's thousands of years old and it's resilient. And it's been through many bumps and curves in the road in, in the past. So I'm confident that the hotels and whether it's Tim's hotels or mine's Yankees, that we will be ready. The hotels will be ready to welcome you and will be ready in a way that you can trust and is supporting your wellness as well as recreating your experience for enjoyment with your family or your business. So be ready to return and we're ready to welcome you. Brilliant. Chris mentioned um, about hotels needing to get really creative with things and how even a Michelin star restaurant was now just doing cheeseburgers. Um, Tim and Simon, very quickly, before uh, we get cut off, because I'm very mindful of the time, um, tell me one thing that you think is the most creative thing that your hotel group is doing that might surprise us. Put you on the spot. Tim. <laughs> um, contactless check-in and contactless arrival. So very relevant today, Not hopefully not for too long, but right now, completely contactless. Simon, cheeseburger. Go on to YouTube and look at Chef Simone from the George Sank. He's in his kitchen in the outskirts of Paris and every day he's cooking up amazing dishes, but he's doing it family style. How would you be able to cook it in your kitchen? And he's taken his Michelin star cuisine in his own charismatic way and showing you how you can do that in your home. Uh, expensive doesn't have to be complimented, uh, complicated and you know, tasty doesn't have to be tedious. So I would check out Chef uh, Simone. Brilliant. Uh, we've got one minute left as we leave. Raki, tell us why we should come and stay in all the hotels in Ras Al Khaimah. <laughs> leave us on that message. Because <laughs> we put a mint on your pillow, is that not enough? <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, uh, listen, uh, the great thing about Russell Kema is uh, it's, it is the nature destination. It's the nature emirate of the UAE. 
You've got sprawling spaces, lots of comfort, great place for a family, for a getaway, for an experience. You have everything from five-star luxury villas down to resorts to city hotels. And we've got the mountain. Jebel Jais is our high, is the highest mountain in the UAE. So it's great to come out there, get one with nature, enjoy yourself, and safety and security is there. Our partnership with Bureau Veritas is definitely going to cover that. Um, and uh, and the tourism industry needs you. There's no better reason than to come out than now. Fab. You know what? I think we have now been cut off. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Good job. Thanks, Jim.